Do you like haunted places? Locations with dark histories? Locales where mysterious creatures are often reported? Then you should check out Destination Terror, a podcast that takes you to the most haunted places in the world. Places haunted by ghosts, ghouls, and even the past. Search for and rate Destination Terror on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. There lives an inhuman monster in the Redwood Forest. If you find yourself in that place, walk quietly and be prepared, because she may already know you're there. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails if you want to see a cute but creepy video of a vampire bat chasing after some fat hogs. Today I've got an assortment of mostly monster-related stories, featuring the Beast of the Redwood Forest and an encounter at Skinwalker Ranch. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them here. Now, let's begin. Coyotes, gunfire, and what was that? From Romia Chick. A few months back, I decided to go camping. I hadn't been camping in a very long time, and soon it would have been too cold to go. It was a Thursday when I asked my boyfriend, Diesel, if he'd like to go with me. We had just gotten a dog last year, and we'd only taken her on hikes. I thought she'd really like camping. She's a purebred Australian Shepherd, tricolored, and her name is Haley, but I call her Hey Hey most of the time, like the chicken from Moana. Diesel agreed to go camping, and we started to pack. In no time, we were on our way. I chose a particular forest that was only three hours away. As we pulled up, my heart started to beat hard. I was pretty excited, yeah, but my stomach fell as I realized no one else was around. That's weird, I whispered. Diesel laughed. What's wrong? Afraid to be lost in the woods with me? I shoved him playfully. We loaded up all the bags we could carry and I grabbed Haley. She did very well on a leash or chain. She listened pretty good, except when people or other animals came into the picture. We stuck to the trail and realized that we were running out of daylight. We quickly marched down the trail until we came across a good camping spot. We did not want to be too close to the trailhead. Diesel started on the tent while I hooked Haley's chain. It was a long rope tied between two trees with her leash attached. After about an hour, the tent was set up. The fire was going too, and I was setting up the inside of the tent. We would have had the fire started faster, but Haley kept taking twigs out of the pit. Diesel popped up our chairs and put a metal pot full of water in the fire. We had a quick dinner of ramen noodles and hot dogs. Haley stole a hot dog right off my stick, so she ate pretty good that night. While we were chilling, full from dinner, we heard a loud bang. We all jumped. Shortly after, I asked, what was? But I was cut off by what sounded like 20 or so coyotes howling. Diesel smiled at me. Someone's just hunting, is all. I gave him a look and laughed. Well, time to go to bed, I think. I unzipped the tent and looked at Haley, who was still pointed in the direction of the gunshot. She growled softly. We had never seen her do this before. Diesel unclipped her from her leash and led her into the tent. We all piled in and stayed silent. Haley curled up into her bed while we laid on the air mattress. That night, we were all very cold. I could see Hey Hey shivering, so I went and threw a blanket on top of her, leaving her nose sticking out. She seemed happy with this, and within minutes, she was snoring. I grabbed onto Diesel, cuddling into him for warmth and security. He grabbed one of our bags and pulled my gun out. He handed it to me, just in case. He smiled and cocked the BB gun he'd brought. I shook my head at him and smiled, but my heart caught in my chest as another barrage of howls erupted into the silent night. I jumped over to my dog, holding her close, afraid she was going to bark, getting whatever was out there as attention. I held her tight and only a soft bark in her throat came out. But then, I heard a snap from outside, and I jumped again. 
I looked over at Diesel in the dim light, and he locked eyes with me. I was terrified, and he looked worried. More howling and snaps echoed close to us. There had to be at least 30 of them out there by the sound of it. I was very scared they might try and take my dog or try to get in at us. I petted Haley softly, trying to keep her calm. I kissed her head, but then about screamed as something brushed against the tent from the outside. My hand clasped over my mouth as my other arm held onto my dog. Haley growled softly at whatever had brushed up against the tent. I held my breath as my heart tried to burst through my chest. Diesel peeked out of the tent door. He slowly re-zipped the tent and looked over at me, shaking his head. What? I mouthed, trying not to make too much of a sound. He shrugged, putting a finger to his mouth. He signaled to me to listen. I could hear a thump, thump. It was hard to hear anything over my heart beating so hard and so fast. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Haley whimpered softly, so I held her tighter, trying to comfort her. Another round of howls rang out even closer than before. They had to be just about 60 feet from us. Sweat dripped down my temple as I made myself breathe softer. A loud yelp made Haley and myself jump. Some growling started up shortly after. Haley then whined a little too loud, making a lump stick in my throat. I tried to swallow it, but I just couldn't. My whole body began to shake, and I could feel Haley shaking as well. This was it. I was going to be eaten by a bunch of coyotes. My little family was going to get killed and eaten too. What was I going to do? Diesel had unzipped the tent just enough to stick his head and arm out. He had my gun in his hand now. He cocked it, firing off a round into the ground away from us. There was a sudden stillness. I could barely breathe. The gunshot rang loudly in my ears. I'm pretty sure Haley barked at this, but I didn't hear it. It felt as if I was going to pass out. Diesel then shone his flashlight out into the dark. I don't see anything, he whispered. Just then, another four gunshots rang out in the near distance, followed shortly by howls. Another dog also began to bark. My heart felt as if it stopped. I held my dog close to me, hoping the sun would rise soon so we could just get out of here. I had to have fallen asleep at some point because the next thing I knew, I was awakened by another strange sound. I opened my eyes and quickly looked around. Our fire was completely out, and our lantern was off. I shivered. It was a lot colder than I thought it would get. I blinked a few times, straining my ears to figure out what had awoken me. I was just starting to believe it was the cold that woke me, when a soft, whooping sound caught my attention. It was close, very close, whatever it was. I could hear a footstep every so often. I shook Diesel, trying to wake him quietly. I could hear whatever it was outside, breathing now. It was very close. Diesel awoke and looked at me. I had my hand over his mouth just in case. We sat up and I grabbed the dog again. She was asleep still but I wanted to make sure she wouldn't wake at random and start barking. There was more deep breathing, and then a soft... <sighs> came from that thing. I grabbed the gun and went to unzip the tent. Then smack, smack, smack. It sounded like something smacked a tree. Maybe it was a large dog hitting a tree. I wasn't sure. It did this every few minutes. I sat back down quickly, holding on to both the dog and Diesel. I almost wet myself when I heard that thing out there let out a loud shriek. It was low and hurt my ears. It began to step away, grunting as it did. Tears filled my eyes. I hadn't been that scared in a long time. I woke up the next morning. We packed up in a hurry and got out of there as quickly as we could. 
I'm not sure what was up with that night, and I doubt we'll ever go back. That chain of events was so chaotic and crazy, I still can't believe it all happened. The Cat Lady From Anonymous When I was in fifth grade, I just moved into a new town and a new school, and I didn't have any friends yet. My house was a weird old wooden house with a loft and a fireplace, with weird little nooks we took as bedrooms. There were no doors except the outer ones, and of course the bathroom. The house sat at the end of a mile-long road, which was at a 30 to 40 degree angle up the whole way, so it was quite the slow trudge from the old school bus stop. It was deep in the redwood forest with a stream that ran down behind the house. I spent much of my free time wandering around in those woods. My mom was hardly ever home, and my little sister was usually at daycare, so I was pretty much on my own. One day, I was walking along the stream, which was wider and strewn with granite boulders at this point, when I heard and saw two men up near a plastic pipe, discussing something, pointing to the ground at their feet. Then they pointed off to my right, heatedly. I crept up closer to them and lay flat in the shallow water to hear them better. I could only catch the shouted words of dang cat, as well as age right through the fence and can't just go shooting things in a residential. They climbed up the embankment and down a dirt fire road. I stayed quiet for a minute to make sure they were gone. I went to go see what they were pointing at. It turned out to be a big paw print of a cat. Now, I wanted to see a real mountain lion myself, which was probably a bad idea, but still, I strode through the cold stream to the right-hand bank and up the steep embankment, redwood detritus crumbling under my feet as I scrambled up, grabbing branches and clumps of grass or weeds as I went for support. I wandered through the brush, out from the big trees and into areas of mostly yellow-flowered weeds, taller than me, and sandstone. I passed by anthills and an old rotting outhouse. There was nothing in it but a dissolved roll of toilet paper. There must have been a house out here at some point, probably washed away by the stream in winter flood season. There had been a house right behind ours on the road I lived on, but it was washed away too in the floods about five years before. We heard from the neighbors too that the floods took the old man that lived there with it. A sad story. Anyway, I kept on walking, and I saw another set of tracks in the looser sand, and I began to follow those. The sun was getting low in the sky. I'd say it must have been 5 or 6 p.m. on an August day. I had no phone or watch back then, but I knew it wouldn't be dark for a couple of hours yet. I came upon a small sand hill, about 40 feet or so high with traces that some kids had been sliding on it at some point. There was a small makeshift foothold ladder dug up in the steep side. The tracks skirted around this hill, and though I thought I should come back here at some time, I kept following these tracks. They were overlapping with older tracks now. The animal had come through this way a lot recently. Then I heard movement, followed by a low growl. I crouched down under a low manzanita branch. Then I saw, deep in a big blackberry hedge, a cat's huge gold eyes looking straight at me. I realized at this point, finally, that maybe this could be dangerous. I slowly backed out of the branches and walked sideways back to the hill, climbing up to the top where there was a big scrub oak. I thought I could climb it and get away, not knowing big cats were great climbers. She followed me one step at a time, like some weird wild tango, my foot, then her foot. I could see low-hanging teats, like she'd recently had kittens. Then suddenly, she ran at me, knocking me down, pinning me down by the shoulders. I was staring her right in her face, smelling her breath, which was meaty and strong. She made a yowling noise, followed by a hiss. I scrambled out from between her paws. She slapped up my leg once, hitting sand. I ran up the rest of the hill, getting up the oak in less than a minute skinning my knees, which worried me. I walked out onto a very long limb, the big cat just staring at me, sitting there. We stared at each other for a while. Eventually, she made this weird chuff-chuff noise, turning her head, 
getting up and walking off in another direction. She only looked back at me to chuff again. I swear it sounded like she was laughing at me. Quietly, I got down from the tree and made a beeline to where I thought home would be. Once I got back, I locked myself in the bathroom until my mom and sister got home. But I didn't tell them anything. I went out to see if I could find her again about a month later. This time, I took a big knife tied to a stick with me and a spray bottle of vinegar for protection. I know, stupid, I know. I came upon the blackberry hedge I saw her at last, and I heard singing coming from it, a low humming. I snuck up. There I saw an older blonde woman. She had a scar on her chin and a really old navy flowered dress with holes in the arm seams. It was like she had found that dress on the side of the road, but she and it were actually clean. In fact, she was washing something in a metal tub with sand instead of soap. She took it out, wrung it, and threw it on a big flat boulder in the sun. She put her foot up and sat down on the boulder. She was barefoot and kept humming to herself looking up at the sky. Then she pulled off the dress she had on and threw it in the tub. She was nude then, but her hair was long and I really couldn't see much. When she was done scrubbing that dress, she wrung it out and laid it out on the rock with the other. Then comes the weird part, if that wasn't weird enough already. She hopped down off the rock, got on all fours, and I swear I'll never forget what I saw next. Her body changed into that of a mountain lion. It only took a few seconds. Fur rose out of her muscly skin, around her shoulders first, and her nose broadened. Her feet lengthened, her tail grew longer. She then sauntered off down the sandy path. I sat there not knowing if I was sleeping or awake. I left as silently as I could and went home. I had nightmares that night, and I kept thinking she was at my window the whole time, watching me. I went back to the sand hill again a couple of times, but I didn't see either form of her again, not until my birthday. I was turning 10 and my mom told me to invite some friends over for a party. I really didn't have any friends yet, but I asked all the girls in my class. Mom said no boys, and about five of them said sure. We walked the two miles to my house up that long hill, which was quite a bit for a couple of them that I knew lived off the golf course and probably never walked that far in their lives. But we got there and we had some snacks and cake and my mom said they could stay the night if they wanted to. So they called their parents and all but one said okay. We ended up having a lot of time to kill. I decided to take them all out to the sand hill to play on the slide. They said that sounded great. We walked out to the hill and played there for an hour, but I kept an eye out for the cat lady thing, but I didn't see her. My new friends noticed me looking away every so often, and they asked what I was looking for, so I told them. They of course didn't believe me, so I took them to the Manzanita and Blackberry Hedge to show them the tracks at the very least. They kind of freaked out then that there could be a killer out here, and so we headed back to my house. One of the girls even grabbed my arm as we walked single file through a sand gully, pointing up on the lip of the little canyon. I saw her then, in cat form, following along and watching us. My friend began dragging me, and as she did, the other girl saw the cat too, and began to scream and run. I grabbed one of them and shouted, Don't run! It makes her want to chase you! And so we walked, squealing and crying out of the gully and up onto the road near my house. I looked back, and the cat was in woman form now, sitting crouched on the edge of the cliff, watching us. She even waved at me a little. I raised my hand and waved back. The girls got to my house, and some of them called to be picked up, but three of them still spent the night, telling scary stories and eating lots of sugar until morning. Those three ended up being my friends even 30 years later. But we did end up moving a month or so after that to a house in town, and I never saw the cat lady again. So, uh, thanks for not eating me, cat lady. Skinwalker Ranch From Bee Dog Years ago, 
my son Brendan and I went to visit Grandpa Kermit in Utah. We had a great visit. All was good, and at the time Brendan was very much into ghost stories and the paranormal. We talked about Skinwalker Ranch. I told Brendan it was only 20 miles away from Grandpa's place. Of course, as a dad, I said we could go check it out since we were close on our trip. That night I figured we were just going to hang out in the dark and nothing was going to happen, but at least my son would be happy. At about midnight, we decided to take off from Grandpa's to Skinwalker Ranch. I'd say we got there around 12.45 a.m. after stopping for some snacks and drinks. We planned for a night of scary stories and spooky things happening, but I had no idea what was about to come. Brendan was excited. He had brought his EMF he bought off the internet for ghost hunting, as well as a voice recorder to catch the voices of spirits. We spent the afternoon scouting the area, trying to find a place to sit and watch. Before we'd left, I'd used Google Earth to look at the best spots we could go to. The spot I'd found was a high spot. We sat there and we could see the whole ranch late that night. We decided to put his recorder about 30 yards in front of the car by a bush. We then sat on the hood of the car, telling stories and basically just watching and talking for a couple of hours. As a precaution, I brought my hunting knife with me, just in case. We could hear the sounds of an oil field a few miles behind us. They were very, very loud, with the occasional boom, boom, boom echoing just loud enough to interrupt the night. We also heard frogs from the stream about 40 yards in front of us, croaking into the night as we talked. Every once in a while, a generator from a nearby house would kick on. After a couple of hours of this, we were both sitting on the hood of the car and out of nowhere, we heard this massive growl. It wasn't a plain growl either. It was this horrible, evil-sounding growl that caused me to sit straight up. The sound was unexplainable. Not to mention, Brendan and I heard the same sound, but from different directions. At first, I was thinking, maybe it was a joke. Maybe someone's messing with us. The sound was startling enough for this 38-year-old father to jump off the hood of the car, hunting knife at the ready. As I jumped up, I grabbed the flashlight too, and I began to shine it in the direction that I was sure the sound had come from. To the left of us, Brendan yelled that it wasn't over there. No, he'd heard it from the right side of us. So I shone the light both left and right as fast as I could. When I saw nothing, I yelled to Brendan to get back in the car right now. The best way I could explain that growl was like a hellhound was after us. We both jumped in the car, and all of a sudden, everything went silent. The noisy night around us had suddenly just went quiet. We sat there for a few minutes, speechless. I was wondering if what just happened actually happened. Eventually, we began to talk about what happened. Brendan was still sure he'd heard that sound from the far right of us, but I was certain it was to the left. We argued about what actually happened, but we agreed that being in the car was the safest bet. After realizing what just happened was beyond weird, we remembered the voice recorder 30 yards in front of us by a bush. So after getting the guts to do this, I told Brendan I was going to run and grab the voice recorder for him. I told him if I don't come back, haul tail out of the place and don't look back. I sprinted to the bush and grabbed the voice recorder then I ran back to the car. I threw the recorder inside first, then I climbed in, and we left as fast as we could. Upon getting back to Grandpa's, we pulled out the voice recorder. We spent some time listening to the recording around the time of the incident. After multiple listens, we never did hear the loud sound of the growling or animals we heard. At first, I thought, well, maybe it just didn't pick it up. But if that was the case, why did the voice recorder pick up the oil rig a few miles away? We could even hear the frogs in the recording, which came from the stream 40 yards away from us. I was sure the growl we heard was far louder than all of that. The recording was solid. There was no possible way that sound would not be recorded. 
I'm telling you, it was insanely loud. So what was it? We listened to that recording several times over the next few days, and years in fact. We went back from time to time to see if we could find out what happened back there, but we still have no clue. As a full-grown man with years of life experience, I honestly cannot explain what happened. I tell this story still as a skeptic, and I try to chalk it up to something normal. But I can't help but feel deep down that what the two of us heard and experienced was far from normal. What was that thing? From Zach. When I was about nine years old, I was living in a small house in a small town. One night, I was home alone with my older brother. My parents were gone for the night, so we just played video games in the living room. My brother got up to go get some food for us. He was gone for about 15 minutes. I was suspicious as to why he was gone so long, so I got up and went to go in the kitchen to look for him. But he wasn't there. I called out for him, but he didn't answer. I was starting to get nervous. The house was silent, so silent you could hear a mouse running through the walls. I then noticed the TV wasn't making any noise, which was strange because I didn't turn it off when I got up. I then went to go check to see why the TV had turned off. When I got to the TV, I tried to turn it back on, but nothing happened. I checked behind the TV and it was unplugged. I was starting to think my brother was trying to scare me, so I yelled out, Hey, stop. I'm going to tell mom or dad. But there was nothing. No sound, no response. I was really beginning to get scared. I was almost crying, but I decided to search the rest of the house for my brother. After trying, I couldn't find him anywhere. When I checked our hallway, I found the basement door open, but not all the way. Just a little crack, just enough for someone to be watching me without me noticing that they were. I approached the door and all of a sudden, a big bang, almost like something had fallen down the stairs, nearly shook the whole house. It sounded like something or someone falling down the stairs. Quickly, I opened the basement door. And that's when I saw it. This pale, skinny, tall-looking thing crawling towards the basement exit. I slammed the door shut, running to the front door window. I saw it again, now running on its back legs, disappearing into the dark forest. I was so scared, I couldn't speak, I couldn't even move, until my brother came up behind me and tapped on my shoulder. I was startled, turning around in an instant. My brother was just standing there, asking me if everything was okay. Beginning to cry, I told him, no, I was looking everywhere for you. Where were you? He replied, I was outside. My friend came over to the house and knocked on the back door, so we chatted for a bit. Okay, I said, and I walked away. I didn't want to tell my brother what I just saw, so I went upstairs to my room. I called my parents, explaining what happened to them. I told them they had to come home soon, Later that night, around 1.30 a.m., my parents finally got home. I was already sleeping by then, so I didn't know what happened or what my parents talked about regarding what I had told them. We still live in the same house today, but nothing has happened since that night. Thank God. Whatever that thing was, I hope to never see again. I have no idea what it was from Carol Lane. This encounter happened when I was 14. I live in Quebec, Canada. There was a time when I was a very troubled teenager. I'm Christian and I do believe in God. Around the time of the encounter with that thing, I was having a rough patch with my parents and older brother. I grew up in a toxic family. I was slowly straying further from God and my beliefs. One night, after a very heated argument with my father, I went to bed and cried in my room until I fell asleep. I had the most terrifying dream that night. 
In the dream, I was in my room, and I saw this thin, gray, man-like figure walking backward on my wall and ceiling like a possessed spider coming towards me. Its mouth was open with horrible pointy teeth and empty eye sockets. I couldn't wake up. I couldn't do anything. What ended up waking me up was my dog with a low growl. I sat up wide awake. My room was dark, but I could immediately see my mom pacing back and forth in my room. She seemed to be looking for something and kept her head down. She was wearing the same nightgown from before I went to bed with a little heart on the chest. Mom? I called out to her three to four times. She didn't lift her head or acknowledge me. No reaction at all. I was fully awake and very confused as to why my mom was in my room, looking for something in the middle of the night. Also, why would my dog growl at her? I kept looking at my mom without blinking. Then I reached over for my bed lamp. I switched it on, still not blinking once. Then, the figure I thought was my mother was gone. It disappeared before my eyes. I turned around in my bed and got on my stomach, wondering what the heck just happened. Suddenly, I heard my door opening slowly and some low gibberish in my dad's voice. Still on my stomach, I didn't have the chance to lift my head. My dog jumped off the bed and went into my closet. Then, a heavy weight crushed me on my bed. Keep in mind, the light was on now. I saw myself literally sinking into my mattress with the pressure of something on top of me. Something was holding my whole body and pushing like there was no tomorrow. I'm a six foot, 200 pound woman and I could not move, nor could I scream or call for help. I was paralyzed, terrified. Then all at once, it went away. The pressure and the presence, all of it just left. I was still scared, so I jumped out of my bed and ran into the living room. I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. I waited for my parents to wake up, and I told them everything. Of course, they didn't believe the story, and thought it was an excuse as to why I didn't sleep during the night again. I'm 27 years old, and now I'm still having trouble adjusting to sleeping in the dark. When I looked this up on the internet, I found the story of the rake. I know it's a creepypasta, but it looked exactly like the thing from my dream, which I think has everything to do with what happened when I woke up. I'm still shivering to this day when I think about it. It doesn't feel like I'm alone when I try to sleep, and I'm hoping I'm just paranoid. Were they dogs? From Wendigo Lover. This happened quite a while back when I was eight or nine years old. At the time, my family and I lived in a wooden house in the mountains, though we later moved into town when I was 10. Back then, whenever my dad worked the second shift, coming home around 8 p.m., sometimes mom and I would bring my aunt and younger cousin to hang out. You know how it goes. The younger ones play, the older ones stay. One afternoon, we were slowly getting ready to go, planning on dropping off the guests. Afterwards, we'd wait for dad to arrive at grandma's so we could all get home before the cold hit. Winter was approaching, hence the fact that we didn't want to get home to a freezing house. Having a fireplace with a chimney as our only source of heat didn't exactly help. It was near sundown, everything still lit by barely any sunlight. I remember my mom letting me stay in the car to wait for my relatives to finish packing up. I don't know why I even wanted to do that, but I'll chalk it up to kids being kids. So I was inside the car for about five minutes. Suddenly, a brown blur appeared around one of our trees. It was approximately 150 meters away from the vehicle. It looked like fur from what I could see. Beautiful light brown fur. And I say blur because it looked like a dog jumping around the tree in a very fast motion. The strange thing lasted for about two to three seconds, leaving an image in my head that is still clearly present to this day. I didn't really react in a certain way. 
I was thinking that the wind blew some dirt around, as we had a lot of gravel in the same area where I spotted the apparent dog. Interesting thing was, a canine, or whatever it resembled, couldn't be seen anywhere, even though I looked around the yard as best I could from the car's window. The occurrence was left unmentioned to anyone else at the time, because I didn't think it was worth telling anyone. My parents probably wouldn't have believed me. Fast forward a few months later, we woke up to chewed up toys that I'd left outside the night before. There were also teeth marks in the large plastic bag near the fence. It covered a big amount of dirt that my parents bought a few years prior. That night, I vividly remember hearing howling sounds, multiple howling sounds. They didn't exactly sound like those of a dog. It sounded like that of a wolf. But we don't have wolves in those mountains, not even foxes or smaller predators. Sometimes I still remember the face of my rubber duck, seeing its mouth completely chewed off, leaving a significantly big hole in it. Another event that I believe was somehow related to the previous two happened one summer. I was having a sleepover with my best friend, as summer break had just begun, and we wanted to get away from the city's loud atmosphere. The first of the three nights we stayed there, I could hear heavy breathing outside the window. At first, I thought it was her, my best friend. She lay right beside me, occasionally laughing. However, she heard it too. Then, a few minutes later, I heard footsteps. They sounded too light to be considered human, but far, far too heavy to be that of a pet, like a cat or dog, as cats were a common sight, as our neighbors did own one. On the third night, my grandma joined us for a movie in the living room. Rain started to come down, soon turning into a heavy drizzle. That didn't bother us, though. Actually, it added to the atmosphere. Unfortunately, something else did occur. Along with the raindrops, scratching noises could be heard from outside. I felt unnerved, trying to find their source while walking around the rooms, but with no luck. My friend and grandma didn't seem to be phased by it, brushing it off as small sticks falling from the tree above the roof. Something told me not to look out the biggest window in the house, opposite of what my curiosity wanted me to do. To my luck, everything stopped after a few minutes, and I hoped we could sleep in peace that night. We did, in fact, hearing nothing unusual throughout the whole eight hours we slept. This series of events has me wondering, what was that fast chunk of fur? Why did those howls sound so weird? What did those footsteps belong to? And what was scratching at the house's walls? It could have been dogs, but I don't think so. I can't help but think I saw and heard something else. Werewolf in Canada from Dark Raven NFFC. This is a short but scary encounter. It is a story from my Canadian friend, so I'll share it from their point of view. It was a late Friday afternoon. I was taking a walk in a forest near my house. There was barely anyone in the woods at the time, which was perfectly normal at the time of day. Everything was fine for the first half hour, but after that, the sounds of nature suddenly stopped. The woods were far too still. I tried to ignore this. I kept on walking, but then I heard rustling and twigs snapping in the brush to my right. This was followed by a sensation, like someone was watching me. It was an odd feeling, but once again, I did my best not to pay too much attention to it. I started to walk again. The next weird thing that happened was a distant howl. I say again, it was distant, but it was still quite loud, and this was followed by an even louder roar. That was when I ran. I knew that something was trying to find me. My instincts were confirmed when, from my right, a huge, fur-covered creature jumped out onto the path. This creature had glowing amber eyes, a tail, sharp teeth, with a build like a muscular man, but with wolf-like features, 
like a muzzle and pointed ears. It was standing on two legs like a man too, except its joints were bent weird. I looked at the thing for what felt like hours. I waited for it to do something, or for me to gather the courage to move again. Eventually, I think it decided I wasn't worth the time, and it began to walk back into the woods where it came from. My heart pounding and my mind returning to me, I sprinted quickly towards my car, and I sped away from that place. When I looked back in the rearview mirror, something that I still regret doing, I saw that thing from earlier chasing me now, on all fours, almost matching the speed of my car. I was absolutely terrified. I eventually lost it, but when I got home, I heard yet another howl. Luckily, I was already in my house. I tried to get some sleep that night, and eventually I did. But sometime after, I awoke to sounds at my window. When I opened the blind, sure enough, I saw that same creature, or at least the same kind of creature, sniffing around outside. It was trying to find me still. I didn't know what to do, I panicked. This thing was at least eight feet tall, and I knew that if it got in, it would be the end of me. But I guess luck was on my side, because once more, it walked back into the woods behind my house. I haven't seen it since, and I hope I never see it again. It grew. From Slytherin Serpent 287. This happened when I was around 12. My mom had taken me to her office for the day. My siblings were at summer camp, and I didn't have anything to do at the time. My mom told me that she was going to be working late that day, so she said we would be staying until around 10 or 11 that night. Being a night owl, I was totally okay with this. In fact, I thought it'd be super cool to stay awake this late, as my usual bedtime was 9 o'clock. I had a pretty good day. My mom let me sit in the old office of one of her former co-workers and let me choose whatever I wanted for lunch and dinner, so I chose the most unhealthy options I could. Around 9 p.m., all the other employees at the office had left for the day, except for me and my mom. At that point, I was just staring out the window of my own little office. That's when I saw an old man staring right up at me. He had the biggest smile on his face, like a little kid in a candy shop. Immediately, I was creeped out, because the last thing I wanted was to be stalked by a creepy old man, and this was an industrial area. Not necessarily an amazing place to be walking at 9pm, especially when it's pitch black outside. There were barely any street lamps out there. Suddenly, the man began to walk towards the building. And, I kid you not when I say this, I saw his legs beginning to grow. And before long, he was level with me. I was on the third floor. He must have grown around 30 feet in 5 seconds flat. I was scared out of my mind, and I wanted to run so badly, but I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't do a thing. I remember him saying something along the lines of, What a precious little twelve-year-old girl. This freaked me out even more. How did he know my age? Before I could react, he shrank back down to his original height, and when I looked back out the window, he was gone. When I got home that night, I couldn't stop thinking about what just happened at the office. The man chased me through my dreams, and even though I never saw him again, I'm still too scared to go back to my mom's office at night. The Creature in the Cabin From P&W Samwise to begin, I'd like to say that this is my first time writing and sharing about an experience I've had growing up in the woods. You don't have to believe me or any part of my story. I know what I saw, and I know it was real. Growing up, my brother, T, and I were adopted into a family of eight around the time I was four and T was six. I would say it was a fairly normal adoption, but that couldn't be further from the truth. The family that adopted us lived in the Pacific Northwest. 
They had a property of around 70 acres with nothing but woods around. The cabin they built was quite literally in the middle of the forest. You'd have to drive a considerable amount of time, 30 to 40 minutes, to get into the nearest town. On this property, my family built several shop buildings to store wood for the cold seasons and to hold random equipment and machines. These buildings were spread all around the property. Some of them are even older than the cabin my father built, only held together by old rotting wood and rusted steel. They always seemed to give off ominous vibes. You could oftentimes feel something watching you if you ever went into them alone, and even with other people sometimes. I give all this context just to give you perspective on the size of the property and the feelings it gives off. This specific experience I wanted to share today started on a night in the late summer, early fall. I was about 11 years old at the time. The evening was slowing down as I laid in the grass on the lawn outside the cabin. Feeling a breeze pick up and observing the sunset, I decided it was time for me to head inside. I got inside and brushed my teeth. I then headed to my mom's room to say goodnight. After that, I went to T's room to say goodnight. We joked around and talked for a bit before I headed off to bed. As I was stepping outside to go down into the cellar, where my room was, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. I quickly observed a deafening silence that accompanied this feeling. It was odd for the woods to be quiet at night, especially in the summer. You'd expect to hear the crickets and croaking of frogs, but at that moment, there was nothing. I took note of this, and with great haste, I ran down to the cellar. I kicked open the cellar door that was made of solid oak slabs. That was the most efficient way to open it, because it didn't have a traditional doorknob. I ran inside my bedroom, slamming the door behind me with such force it shook my room. I hate it when that happens, I said aloud to myself. Deciding to try to calm my nerves down a little, I began to sing some goofy little tune not knowing what was going to happen in just a few moments. I took off my shirt to put on my nightshirt, then I hopped into bed, where I would think I was safe from whatever was peering at me. As I was walking towards my bed, only two paces in front of me, there was a snapping pop in midair. Taken aback, and quite frankly on the verge of soiling my pants, a figure appeared with the pop. Right in front of my eyes stood this being, pitch black like he had been hiding out in a chimney his whole existence. His eyes were void of color or any human emotion or expression. I'm not quite sure how long he and I just stared at each other. It could have been two seconds or ten minutes because it felt like a lifetime. The absolute terror as I looked into this thing's eyes ate me up inside. It was like staring at something you knew could kill you in that second, but it somehow chose not to. Something with such emptiness that all there is is just a void. Feeling as though my soul was violated, I scrambled to run for the door. I grabbed the door handle, I swung it open. As I was making my bolt out of the cellar and into the dark, I looked back and I saw that thing staring at me with those empty eyes. I ran swiftly across the gravel on my bare feet until I got to the back door of the cabin. I ran inside to my brother T's room, sobbing and shaking uncontrollably. The first thing he asked was, Did you see a ghost or something? He quickly came over to comfort me. To this very day, he still says he's never seen me or anyone else look so scared. After he was able to calm me down some, we decided to go tell my parents. They were both very much Christian. My father was to the point of being cult-like. I told them I saw a demon and they saw how shook up I was. But quickly, they both denied it, completely dismissing whatever I saw. They never brought it back up to me after that night. My parents were gracious enough to let me sleep in one of our guest rooms for the night probably because I refused to sleep in my bedroom after that. Nothing more happened that evening, besides me tossing and turning, wondering what on earth just happened. 
I feel as though this was my most bone-chilling encounter. Animus River Monster from R and CO. This happened when I was in sixth grade. My family and I live in a small mountain town near Farmington. My dad and I enjoyed the outdoors. We loved to fly fish, hike, and ride motorcycles. One day, my dad and I went fly fishing in the local river, called the Animus, also known as the River of Lost Souls. As we were setting up our fly rods, I heard something in the water, something that sounded like breathing. As my dad and I stared into the water, we saw something very big swimming through. A massive fish then jumped out of the water. We both sighed with relief. Looks like fishing's gonna be good today, my dad said. But no, it wasn't that. Something wasn't right, that fish was not normal. The more I thought about it, the more I realized it looked as if something had taken a big chunk out of it. Not a big bite, I'm talking a huge chunk. My dad continued to set up his rod, and I decided I was just seeing things, because I would always listen to scary podcasts and things like that, so maybe I'm just paranoid or on edge. I finished setting up my fly rod, getting it ready to go before my dad. So I wandered down the riverbank a ways until I heard it again, that breathing sound like the time before. This time, it was coming from the water behind me. I spun around on my heels and slipped on a rock. As I looked up, the breathing had stopped, but there was something touching my hand. I looked down and I saw a fish head and innards spilling out under my hand. Oh God, I muttered, half talking about the fish and half talking about my fall. I quickly got up and checked on my rod, which I had dropped when I fell. Just then, I heard breathing and water splashing from the middle of the river. I looked over and I saw this strange humanoid-looking being emerging from the water. It had nails like long claws with strange webbing in between the fingers. Its eyes were those of a snake. I shook my head and took another look, but by then, it was gone. Whatever it was, was unnaturally fast. I got up and ran to my dad. My dad was a believer in the paranormal as well as me, but he just didn't think it would be possible. Later that night, we'd gone to my favorite restaurant, Home Slice Pizza. As we drove home in my dad's Tacoma, I looked out my window, though it was kind of dark out, and I swear I saw it again. That humanoid, fish-like thing. It was standing on the side of the road, with those tiny, snake-like eyes staring at me. The way its mouth stretched open then reminded me of a smile, showing bright yellow teeth and revealing black blood around its mouth. And then, I swear I saw it wave. That was the last I saw of the thing, but I still feel those freaky eyes watching me sometimes, although it's never been there again. If you're listening, you should know that there are weird creatures out there that exist. Be careful when you're near a river, because you never know what's below the surface. My Haunted Road Story From Responsible Ad 7305 The name of this road is Lick Road in Cincinnati, Ohio. A group of my friends and I went to Lick Road while we were in high school. The story of this road is that a girl named Amy, no one knows if this is the actual name of the girl, was assaulted and killed at the end of the road. People got the name Amy because a sign was spray painted with the name using reflective paint next to that road. So the name Amy took off. Legend has it she supposedly haunts that road looking for help. Another thing about this road is of course you have to time your headlights. At 12 a.m. exactly, you're supposed to flash the lights three times. The windows are said to fog up and the words, help me, show up in the fog all over the car. Sometimes you gotta wait a few minutes, and I swear this actually happened to us. 
On to our story. We arrive at said road around 11.30 p.m., and of course there's patchy fog down the whole road, which put everyone on edge already. The road itself is somewhat long with privately owned land at the end of it. Where you're supposed to park is kind of a dirt turnaround kind of thing, with a gate at the other end. The good stuff happens on the other side of that gate, of course. So we split into two groups of three. Three of us sat by the car and tried to get evidence, while the other group of three, me included, go past the gate. Past that gate is a dirt path that takes you to a small bridge where the body was supposedly dumped. We all had flashlights, recorders, and cameras. Just regular snap cameras. We got a few feet into the path, and the first oddity that happens was my flashlight dying. This thing stays charged for up to six hours, but it just died, even though I had just charged it all the way, right before we left. It just freaking died, and it didn't come back on until I plugged it up back at home. Then something creepy happened to me and only me for some reason. I saw this face about eight or nine feet in a tree. It didn't have eyes or a mouth. I turned away to make sure my mind wasn't playing with me. I looked back, expecting maybe the moon or something, but there was nothing. The face I'd seen was now gone. I kept it to myself, not sure if I was just tripping. We kept going until we got to the bridge. Once there, it was dead quiet. You could barely hear the water underneath the bridge. My friend Jay and I went out onto the bridge together, trying to get some pictures. I thought he was behind me the whole time, but it turns out he never went as far as I did. At a certain point, I felt breathing on my neck. I told Jay to stop messing around, but when I turned and looked at him, he was still at the start of the bridge. It couldn't have been him. I had a minor freakout, walking right back to my friend. Now, while we were up there, another friend of mine, P, went underneath the bridge. We were all extra terrified when P comes running, hauling tail back up the hill, saying that he saw a shadow figure in the woods. So all of us booked it back to the car. While we're running back, we hear what sounds like a set of footsteps running past us then, all three of us see three huge shadow figures running through the woods right beside us. They darted past us in almost a blur, but slow enough to see them individually. They tore through the woods, and thankfully that's the last we saw of them. We get back to the car, and we begin to leave. Only, that's when we saw that the words, Help me, were written all over the car. The three by the car were swearing up and down that they hadn't done it, and seemed as scared as we were. We hear footsteps outside the car then, but we didn't see anyone. Even so, we booked it away, going around the corner to the nearby UDF, where we parked and tried to collect ourselves. We shared our experiences of the night together. No one else saw or felt anything as much as I did. We also think that whatever was out there may have followed us home because we all were awakened at the same time of three-ish in the morning that same night. Our clocks were flashing and the power didn't go out. So how could that have happened? Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an eerie cast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.